Hey everybody, thanks for listening to this episode. Thanks for coming along, whether it's the morning, the afternoon, or the night. This is the Edible Attitude Podcast. Unfortunately, Cody is not with us today on this episode. He found out his wife was pregnant and he had to take a week off. So, in lieu of Cody not being here, we have invited someone back to the studio who has been here before. Here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Gimli himself. How you doing, Aaron? How's it going? Oh, it's going pretty good. What are you up to? Oh, not a whole heck of a lot. Playing around with my uh, pool. Oh, yeah, you got a pool. Yeah. Yeah, you told me about that. How you doing on setting it up? Almost done? Oh, she's finally completed. Let's hope she holds together, though. How, How long did it take to set up the whole thing? The first time or the second time? Yeah. You set it up once already? Yeah. Oh, shit. How long did that take? Honestly, only about 20 minutes, half hour. 20 minutes to a half hour. See, people? You can do it, too. What about the What about the second time? Uh, about a day and a half. Oh, shit. <laughs> what, what, what happened? What was the big difference? Holes was the difference. Lots of holes. Like the movie. Yes. Did you find peaches in the holes? No, I did not. Damn it. I found agony and pain. <laughs> agony and pain. <laughs> and hot. Very hot. Very hot. We had this on the list of stuff we wanted to talk about before, but unfortunately, like I said, Cody isn't here. So we're going to talk about it with you. What do you know about the 27 Club? The 27 Club. Are you saying, like, the 27 Club from back in the day? I don't know what back in the day is. I'm not as old as you. That's bullshit! Uh, 27 Club from, like, back in the 60s, 70s? Oh, it's still going on, man. For real? Yeah. Oh. Still a thing. No shit. What do you know about it? Nothing. You thank n- God. Don't know shit. Huh? I don't know shit. I know nothing. All right. Well, let me give you some background on it. The 27 Club is an informal list consisting mostly of popular musicians, artists, actors, and other celebrities who all died at the age of 27. Although the claim of a quote-unquote statistical spike for the death of musicians at that age has been refuted by scientific research, it remains a cultural phenomenon, with many celebrities who die at 27 noted for their high-risk lifestyles, which would make sense, right? I suppose. Because if you, I mean, it's kind of like the rock star lifestyle, the, just drugs, alcohol, fast, sex. Yeah, sex, drugs, and alcohol. Yeah, all of it. Live hard and fast. While the club has been largely connected to musicians, it has since expanded, as many young actors and artists have also lost their lives due to everything from addiction to freak accidents, and we will go over some. Sounds interesting. How far back are we going? There's one person from the 30s, I think. There's one third person from a podcast we did earlier. Really? Yeah. There have been some studies on the club itself, According to music biographer Charles Cross, quote unquote, the number of musicians who passed away at 27 is truly remarkable by any standard. Though humans die regularly at all ages, there is a statistical spike for musicians who have died at the age of 27. Wow. Despite the cultural significance given to the musician and celebrity deaths at age 27, The claim that they are statistically more common at this age is an urban myth. So there's really no scientific, you know, research to back it up. (laughs) It's just the celebrities. It's it's just a hell of a coincidence. (laughs) That's what it just seems like. Yeah. There was an actual study by a university, and it concluded that there were no increase in the risk of deaths for musicians at the age of 27 stating that they were equally small increases at ages 25 and 32. The study also noted that young adult musicians have a higher death rate than the general young adult populations, theorizing that fame may increase the risk of death among musicians, but the risk is not limited to the age of 27. So, I mean, Hmm. even the university did a study about it and found no significant evidence to the age. Right, just... Coincidence. Huge coincidence. So their statistics, or some of them, that they had was that popular musicians are more likely to die at the age of 56 
which is 2.2%, compared to 27, which is only 1.3%. So it's still kind of rare for them to die at that age. Right. So there's really, really no statistical evidence. Again, just a hell of a coincidence. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> sure. Sure. Coincidence. Coincidence, my ass. <laughs> right. Uh huh. Would you care to take a guess at how many? How many people? Now, are we talking to this? Is just all total. How many people total so far are in the club? Probably the hundreds. Just taking a guess. Only 54. Oh, no shit. Well, it's a lot more than I thought. I thought it was going to be like 27 for the 27 club. No. No. It's 54. Maybe there's a 27, like top 27, you know? Could be. I didn't find it, but there might be out there. (laughs) So let's go over some of these popular names that some of you may or may not know. The first one we got on the list is Mia Zapata. Do you know who that is? Not a clue. So she was the lead singer of the band Gits. She was a punk force and the foremost female voice in Seattle's grunge scene. The band's debut album, Frenching the Bully, made them local favorites, but as they prepared their sophomore release, Zapata was brutally beaten, raped, and strangled to death July of 1993. That's damn. Nirvana and Pearl Jam helped raise thousands of dollars to hire a private investigator to look for her murderer. He was not found and convicted until 2003, so 10 years later. In the aftermath, her friends launched a self-defense organization and hosted a series of benefit concerts and released compilations featuring an assortment of Seattle-based bands. Joan Jett would also go on tour with the Gits under the name Evil Stig, which is Gits Live spelled backwards. Huh. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That is neat. I don't like what happened to her. Right, no shit. But the fact that, you know, these grunge bands and these artists came together to... Unite and... Right. Yep. Help create more cause. money for... Help with the cause. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Noble thing. That's what everybody should do, but we live in this world. Second person we got is Randy Stretch Walker. At the height of his popularity... Tupac Shakur's power was such that a person could become famous simply by existing in his direct vicinity. That may be how Stretch rose to prominence, but he possessed far too much raw talent to be written off as another hanger. A skilled producer and a strong rapper in his own right, Stretch was a regular guest on Pac Studio Records after a run with his own group, Live Squad. Whether behind the boards of the mic, Stretch exuded the original gangster authenticity that sold records during the 90s. That same realness eventually made him the target of a November 1995 assassination in Queens, less than a year before Tupac himself would be fatally shot. Allegedly. 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 You think he's still alive? Tupac? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's it's uh it's definitely out there. It's debatable. It's debatable, really is. I mean, there's been pictures of him, but pictures can be falsified, you know. They could be all photoshopped. Time. Photoshopped, big time, especially yeah. nowadays. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Too much of this technology going around. This is another story that never rang a bell to me. Nope. Nope. If he was associated with Pac and he worked with him on some records, a lot of Pac songs you could probably hear. You know, stretches uh, work within right. the song itself. I just don't know which ones they are. I'd have to, you know, look them look up. Look them up, yeah. You ever heard of Jonathan Brandis? No. So in 2003, Jonathan Brandis's death is a dark reflection of the too frequent downfall of former child stars. Brandis began acting at the age of six holding down big parts in soap operas and sitcoms before graduating to films like Stephen King's It. But it wasn't until 1993, at the age of 17, where he got his big break in the popular series Sea Quest DSV. Do you remember that? No. Neither do I. But apparently it was a popular TV show. Unfortunately, it was canceled three years later in 1996. And Brandis struggled to maintain his fame and his career. In 2002, he was set to appear in Hearts War, starring Bruce Willis and Colin Farrell. Whoa. Unfortunately, 
all of his scenes were cut. What? A year after he hung himself in his Los Angeles apartment and then later died at the hospital. I wonder how old he was. 27. (laughs) Everybody on this list is a part of the 27 Club, Aaron. It was a dad pun. I I got that. I didn't like it, but I got it. (laughs) You're going to... You're going to like it. You're going to fucking like it. Deal with it. See, now that I have a, see a picture of him. Okay, I've seen that face before. So have I. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I mean. Yeah, I didn't know who that was, and then I looked him I didn't up. Know, I, I didn't even know he shit. did. No clue. Would have never known except for this list. I'll be damned. Yeah. And I do remember, and now that I see that, there's a clip of him of being a kid, and I'm like, oh, hey, son of a bitch. The next one. Guaranteed you've heard of this person. Guaranteed. Amy Winehouse. That does, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, we all know a little bit about Amy Winehouse. But what we don't know is what her state of mind was when she was at home in July of 2011. She had stated that there were things she wanted to still do with her life, but she seemed unable to take action for them for whatever reason she was very you know guarded about her inner life and what she was going through observing her as you know people have when she was around there's a strong sense that she was just sick of her career kind of like Jimi hendrix or even kurt cobain okay and they were all just prisoners of their image and amy's man was not there at the end and Uh so were many other people that amy depended on but in many of these cases, she had already exhausted those friendships. She kind of like uh, put herself on a desert island? So Pretty to much. Yeah. Isolated herself. And yeah. Said, fuck everybody else. I guess. I mean. I'll be damned. I mean, you can't really know what people are going through. And even when it's said and done, you still don't really know. Right. Unless you've actually, you know, been there physically in their head. People's inner thoughts sometimes get them. More often than not, I think. The demons get the best of them. Yeah. They unfortunately let the intrusive thoughts in. Yeah. Damn those naughty naughty thoughts. I knew about this next one because he was in Star Trek. Okay, I might. Maybe. Maybe. But I I looked at what he what other movies he was in and I couldn't couldn't tell you about him. Okay, shoot your shot. His name is Anton Yelchin. No. <laughs> no. I bet you if you look him up, you'll see him. You'll notice him and be like, hey, I know that guy. He did a lot of work in his 27 years of age. And from 2011 to 2015 alone, he appeared in 18 films. That's pretty good. Damn. In four years. I suppose, yeah. yeah. Oh, four years? Oh, yeah. Okay, okay, all right. Must have been a lot of short ones. The like, amount, of, amount of screen time. Yeah, he had, like, big parts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Man, he was Before, grinding, wasn't he? He was doing mm-hmm. everything that he could, apparently. Jesus. He also did some various voiceover gigs, but he didn't do enough. Unfortunately, his best years had just barely begun when he died in a freak accident. His car pinned him against a brick pillar. How did he... How? How? Did he leave the damn thing and drive? It may have been sitting, you know, maybe he jumped out real quick to grab something and it... Oh, maybe it was a manual and could have been out of gear and could have rolled been. right in. Okay. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Or he, you know, don't, didn't put it in park all the way and actually accidentally put it in neutral, something like that. I don't right. know. No idea. I didn't, I didn't go more into his death. Immovable object and car. Yeah. He was the sandwich. He was in multiple blockbuster movies. Jumping from Star Trek, he played as Chekhov. Oh, that dude. Yeah. Son of a... Yeah, Yeah, I knew who he was, too, because I remember when he died. I was like, oh, man. In the horror genre, he was also in 2011's Fright Night remake. Never seen that movie. And as far as romance goes, he was in Like Crazy. Unfortunately... We can only be grateful for what he's given to us in those four four, four short, short years. years. 
So now was that his uh, in Star Trek? Was that his actual natural accent, or was yeah. that? Yeah, that's what sounded like. Sweet. He he tweaked it to be like Chekhov, like he was supposed to be. Okay, okay. But I mean, he has a very thick accent if you listen to him, like in interviews and stuff. Hmm. Yeah. So that so was he actually trying then? I guess in Star Trek. Oh, maybe he could have been. <laughs> I don't know. You know when he was trying to do the password? Yeah. Like Victor Victor two or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was, and he kept on failing. So maybe that was all. Maybe that was just one take. And he's like, like, I can't get it. (laughs) Fuck. This next one, never heard of him. I feel like I did, but I don't think I ever actually did. Oh, I'm still zero for all of them. So I guess. Oh, come on. You had to have known Amy Winehouse at least. Well, the name rang the bell. But as soon as I saw the picture, I was like, nah. No. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. The next one is, is Jean-Michael Basquiat. For real, dude. 100%. He was an artist. And the year he turned 20, he became an art world celebrity on the path to a pop culture turning point. That's a hell of a name. He dropped out of high school, and he was a self-taught Brooklyn-born artist who spent the late 70s painting graffiti around Soho and in 1980, he allowed his paintings to be featured in a group show. In the years that followed, he collaborated with Andy Warhol, he dated Madonna, appeared Whoa. in Blondie's Rapture video, and cultivated the myth of the temperamental artist. He destroyed some paintings and poured dried fruit and nuts <laughs> on the head of an art dealer. <laughs> Along the way, he developed a serious drug problem, too. <laughs> I go mean, uh, no way. It was bound to happen. Didn't see that coming. Nope. <laughs> the months leading up to his death in 1988 of, and I quote, an acute mixed drug intoxication. Hmm. So that he, is a lot of whatever. Right. Mainly of opioids and cocaine. She must have had a hell of a tolerance. No shit, <laughs> because he claimed... <laughs> To be shooting a hundred bags of heroin a day. The fuck. From, like, he... <laughs> that's, what he said. that's got... There's no... I don't... <laughs> that's got... It, no fucking Could way. You imagine? You would be gone. Out of your mind. Like 24-7. You wouldn't even be here. Right. I, how, how could he even function, period? I have I'm, no idea. Okay, well, but... Look, I don't know much about that shit at all. Right. Like, Neither all I know I. is that it gets you to a point of where you want more and more and more. It's real addictive. But a hundred bags is, that's a lot. I feel like you'd OD after two. Well, it, I, they must, that that information must be like a little bit of false or something because I, what, what is what is a bag? How much is a bag? I have what no idea. Write, that's the know? thing. I have no clue. Is that that one gram? Is that, you know... So we don't really know what that amount was. Yeah. Yeah. It it could have been like real tiny bags. It could be big bags. He didn't really specify. He just said bags. Huh. Either way. So the motherfucker was higher in a kite. All the time. All the time. And And just mad as shit apparently because he probably wasn't high all the the time. So how many drugs were in the system when they did the autopsy? All of it. (laughs) All of it. Yeah. (laughs) At least 100 bags of heroin, heroin apparently. Heroin. Maybe, because even like, well, I'm assuming even 100 grams is like a fuck ton. I'm assuming. <sighs> Let's just say if it, you know, 100, I don't know. I'm not, I don't do that shit. I'm not in that world. So. I don't know how much you have. I don't know how you even have money if you're shooting 100 bags of heroin a day. Well, if you live like a rock star, party like a rock star, you get a rock star money. Oh. Party like an artist too, apparently. Fuck if I know. He's on the list. He's on the list. He made it. Not 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 a list you really want to be on, theoretically, but you. especially at the age of twenty seven, that's some bullshit. Too young. Way too young. On another episode of A Thousand Ways to Die. No shit. Let's a hundred bags of heroin. Well, let's do this. Do you feel it yet? <laughs> shit. <laughs> do you have any ideas for your next piece? <laughs> Here, let me shoot up for a real quick. <laughs> Inspire me. Next one we got on our list is Ronald McKernan. Ron Pigpen McKernan was a sensitive, somewhat unsightly character with a drinking problem. 
He got together with Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir in 1964 to form a jug band that eventually developed into the Grateful Dead. Pigpen started drinking when he was only 12 Whoa. and by his mid-20s had cirrhosis of the liver, ulcers, and many other health problems. Pigpen was on his own and in his apartment in Corte Madera, overlooking San Francisco Bay, when the end came on March 8, 1973. He had been dead for up to two days when his landlady found him. Must have od on alcohol. Right. Just knocked him out. Just alcohol poisoning? I had to have. If he, if he was an alcoholic, I feel like that's the only, one of the only ways to go, especially with all of his health problems that he had. Jesus, that, that's that's a lot of drinking. Well, he started at it when he was 12. That's the... That's a lot. That's a lot. The next one, his name is Brian Jones. Ring a bell? Nope. No. Huh? No. Jones? <sighs> Brian Jones. Never heard of Brian Jones, have you? No. Brian Jones. He was one of the people who started Rolling Stones. No, what? Okay, now, now, yeah, I, I feel ashamed. I should know that. I should have known that. Really, I should. Jones's death at his country home in England in 1969 seems to be the result of his own foolish behavior. To mix alcohol and drugs and then dive into a swimming pool was probably not a good idea. <laughs> Sounded like a good idea at the no, time, no. apparently. As clear as it seems, the death of Brian Jones has become one of the most persistent mysteries of rock and roll, with many people questioning the official version of what happened. Even members of the Rolling Stones have expressed doubts, and still the mystery of his death hasn't been solved. Keith Richards has also said, I don't know what happened, but there was some nasty business going on. Nasty business. Yeah, so it's a mystery. So you think, like, someone tripped him and pushed him in? That's not nasty business. That's just being a dick. <laughs> yeah, but it's nasty if you're like a part of a rival band or some shit. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, he was all loaded with drugs, though. Huh? He, he was. I, loaded, I guess. Yeah. Loaded to the gills and decided to go for a swim. Maybe he was thirsty. He's Maybe like, then. he's like, guys, I bet you anything, I can drink this entire pool. I'm not thirsty. People do weird shit when they're high, man. Man, just think of the amount. How long would it take to piss that out? Again, rock star lifestyle. You got to go hard. <laughs> There's no no, no clear cut answer about this. But you got to go hard. I should have known who that was. Honest to God, I should have known. I, I feel ashamed. I, I also feel ashamed because I also did not know who that was. So I learned stuff. I learned lots of stuff. Like a lot of these people on this list, heard of them, never knew about the club. I heard about the club, but that's about as far as it went. The, the, whatever I saw on TV kind of thing. Yeah, I definitely didn't know there was as many people in there as there are. Oh, shit. And Same. someone's keeping track of it. Well, wouldn't you? Wouldn't I? No, I have other shit to do. <laughs> people die all the time, man. Someone's keeping track of it, but it ain't me. I'm, I'm glad somebody is. We were talking about this man earlier. Oh, buddy. Number nine, Jimi Hendrix. Jimmy. In the early hours of Friday, September 18th, 1970, while staying with his girlfriend in London, Jimmy took some sleeping pills. Now, mind you, I said some. Okay. Nobody knows for sure how many pills he swallowed or whether he even understood what he was taking. The drug was called Vesperax. Vesperax? which is a strong barbiturate. Half a tablet is enough to put a man to sleep for eight hours. Oh, my. Mr. Hendricks may have swallowed as many as nine whole ones. Holy Jesus Christ. On top of that, he had also been drinking. This was real reckless, but it was very much in character for him because during his years on the road, Jimmy had got into the habit of using drugs indiscriminately. His friend, Deering Howe, has also said that Jimmy would take a handful of shit, not even knowing what it was. <laughs> that sounds Just, oh, right. this What's, sounds good. Yeah. Let's do this. 
What do you guys got? Just give me a handful. <laughs> Whatever it is, fuck it. Someone just opens a bag, he grabs a handful of shit, and just, oh, like candy. And then he just walks off. Just carries walks it. off. Jeez. He's gone. Talk about a lifestyle. No, shit. I could not handle these party animals. Sure you could. No, I could not. For Mm-mm. about 10 minutes. No, I'm diabetic. I would die. 100%. My, <laughs> diabetes. Di- my diabetes would be like, no, not even once. Yeah, that was definitely short-lived, Jimi Hendrix. That's... It's unfortunate. Yes, it is. Very yeah. talented. Everybody loved his music. They sure did. Here's another popular name. Janice Joplin. Oh, of course. Yeah. Gotta love her. You gotta imagine how she was feeling, you know, that night as she returned to her hotel room in Hollywood after her last recording session. As she sang A Woman Left Lonely, which was one of the last songs she ever sang, she knew that her boyfriend was taking her for granted, and at around 1 a.m. on October 4th, 1970, she got her heroin kit out and injected one into her arm. Then she went to the cigarette machine in the hotel lobby when she returned to her room with a pack. She closed the door, started to get into bed, reached for her pack on the nightstand, fell over, and smacked her face. She was then found dead the next day. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Classic heroin overdose. Or it was just, you know, like a concussion from the brain and it mixed with the heroin and fucked it all up. It could have been. But there's another case of drugs just getting a hold of somebody. It went sour real quick. Yeah. Went sideways. Once again, another famous one. Another famous person. Quite famous, yeah. Yeah. Here's another man that you may remember. A man by the name of Jim Morrison. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Good old Jim. As the cult of Jim Morrison grew posthumously, taking off in the 1970s, at the end of the 1970s, when Francis Ford Coppola used the end in the soundtrack for his movie Apocalypse Now. Part of the cult of Jim was the coincidence of him dying at the same age as Brian, Jimmy, and Janice. The 27 link helped reinforce the idea that Jim had been special that his death was fated, and that there was something weird going on. So, I mean, all three of them died relatively close close together. You're right. An even added coincidence to that was the fact that Jim's girlfriend had also died at the same age, underlying the weirdness of the coincidence. This legend was familiar to everybody with an interest in popular music by 1994 when Kurt Cobain decided to join the club. Yeah, that's more than now. That's more than a coincidence. Come on. I mean, I don't that know, man. I mean, what? Wow. Okay, for, for okay for the eleven people so far that we've named off. Okay, twelve but, including Kurt Cobain. He's he's the next one. Yeah, I, I figured he was going to be on the list. But all of these combined together, what would what would be the end game? They're just it's like the uh, Zodiac killer, but with the number twenty seven. Like, oh, I'm going to hunt down all these celebrities and make a coincidence out of everything. But, you know what I mean? But the Jim Morrison and the jo- uh, Janis Joplin and then... Or, Jimmy. And Brian. That, that was in the same era, you know, like... All that, in the 70s. That's yeah. where I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That That's why I'm saying, like, come on. That That is a bit too coincidental there. It's... A, it's, it's yeah, for sure. Because that, that, that definitely makes me think about something it's like hey, come on now but now like the other guys that you're talking about at least it was different you know at least another 5 10 15 years later kind of deal or some shit like that but right it stretched out yep and didn't you say this list was going to go all the way to present or close to it close to it yeah i think anton was the closest oh the next one on the list like i said before kirk Cobain. oh yeah his body was discovered by an electrician on friday april 8th 1994 the answer then posed the question by authors of who killed kurt cobain and the answer is simple Mm. kurt cobain killed himself he did so very sudden with self-inflicted violence leaving written evidence of his state of mind kurt's substance abuse counselor remembered how worried the musician had been about losing his home in a lawsuit and usually when someone goes out with a bang that's bullshit. They want to make a big deal about it. It sounded like he was making a statement. You know, like, this is my house. You can't take it away from me type mm. thing. You think so? Maybe. 
I mean, some of the evidence lines up there, but there's also other evidence of some other say shady shit going on. I'm I'm on that shady shit side. Yeah, I'm 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 on the I'm on that side too. Hundred percent. Yeah. Like I. I'm sorry. Ever since it's... I heard about it, I'm like, mm, <laughs> no, no, no something <laughs> weird. Something so, someone, weird. yeah, someone was a little upset. Someone. Yeah. <laughs> someone did something. They fucking hid the evidence. Absolutely, hundred percent. We we all know who that somebody is, but I'm not gonna say the name out loud. <laughs> we got number thirteen coming up. Coincidentally, after Kurt Cobain, the most notable confirmed suicide is of Pete Ham of Badfinger. Pete Ham. He's from one of the bands the Beatles signed to their Apple label in the 1960s. As is the case with suicides, Ham reached a point where death seemed to be the only solution to his problems. He met bandmate Tom Evans in a pub near his home in England on the evening of April 24th, 1975, three days before his 28th birthday. He told him, don't worry, I know a way out. Fortified with drink, Ham then went back to his home, wrote a note in which he expressed his bitterness towards his manager, and promptly hung himself in the garage. Seven years later, Tom Evans did the same thing. You know, that, that is somebody I have no clue who that was. No idea either, but the, no. the concept of him making a statement, and even the, the sketchy, like, I know a way out type thing. Kind of funky. Kind of funky. Kind of sketchy. Pete Ham. What do you think about him? <laughs> I mean, you said never heard of him. Never so heard of him. Let's just, let's just add that one to the list. Yeah. But I found it interesting when I was doing research mm. and the fact that this crypto don't know, don't worry, I know a way out type shit. I don't know. Maybe there was something, something else going on besides right. just him being upset with his manager. Was it really that bad, honestly? I mean, fuck if I know. Musicians are dramatic, man. They're artists. Hmm. All artists are dramatic. Well, so does that mean like all kids are artists? If you're enjoying this topic and would like to talk more about it, you can find us at Edible Attitude or at Edible Attitude Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. So this next one, Cody and I actually talked about him in a earlier podcast we did. Robert Johnson. Robert Johnson. Yep. He's one of the Delta Blues' most celebrated and singular talents. He recorded chilling folkloric songs about hellhounds, the devil, and general despair amid swinging, dissonant, and sometimes off-kilter guitar lines, the lights of which have reverberated through rock and roll for decades. He recorded less than 50 songs, and performed alongside the likes of Howlin' Wolf, Elmore James, and Memphis Slim as he rose to fame. I know none of those names. Same. Never heard of those guys <laughs> before. And the way it's, it's from 1911? Yeah. He's we, oh, my goodness. Doing way back. Yeah, he's... Wow. Yeah. So in August of 1938, just a few months before his 27th birthday... Johnson made moves on the wife of the owner of a roadhouse where he was playing at. <laughs> Drank from an open bottle of whiskey he was offered without even asking. Kind of sounds like Jimmy, you know, with the drugs. And then he promptly died three days later of poisoning and pneumonia. <laughs> he may or may not be buried in an unmarked grave in Mississippi. We don't know. Even in, our, in, even in the earlier podcast, we talked about him and we couldn't figure out where... We decided that he was under a tree, I think. I'll be damned. (laughs) Decided to get fucking shit-faced. Well, no. Well, okay. So he hit on the wife. He hit on the wife. And then he got shit-faced. And then he got shit-faced. Yeah, Yeah, from an open bottle of whiskey because... Someone offered it to him. Well... Some random person. In the story, his, like, friend or whatever, someone offered Robert a drink, and his friend's like, no, don't drink from an open bottle. So someone offered him another one, and he's like, fuck you, I'm taking it anyway. <laughs> Basically, just drank it. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, oops. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> he just did not care. He's like, whatever. 
I got, maybe that's where it all came from. Party like a rock star. Maybe that you know <laughs> could be. Maybe he's the one that started it. Oh yeah, the original rock star. Right. That's true. We did talk about that too. Here's a band I've never heard of, and here's a guy I've never heard of. But his death was a little interesting, so that's why I put him on this uh, list. Okay. His name is Chris Bell. Chris Bell's career was as tragic as his demise was. The talented musician was the driving force behind power pop heroes Big Star. You ever heard of Big Star? No. Nope. No. Nope. Me either. He co-wrote much of the number one record with the singer Alex Chilton and playing the guitar. Upon release, however, the album flopped. Well, probably because uh, we didn't know who they were. <laughs> In the six years following its release, Chris quit Big Star. He then slinked lower into his clinical depression and drug addiction and later had to work at his family's <laughs> restaurant after more failed attempts to relaunch his career. Hmm. In December of 1978, he crashed his car into a pole while he drove home from band rehearsal. Probably. It, it killed him instantly, so oh. there was no suffering. Very classic about every rock star just kind of gets in that drugs and alcohol thing and they just fall yep hard hard yeah some people yolo harder than others man this one sounds just like another classic case where yeah. everybody's got their own rhymes and reasons but it just same song and dance this one just seems kind of innocent sounds like it he lost control maybe uh-huh had a pull a lot of his solo work was released after his death so that's good oh. i mean so is some of his work carried on yeah yeah yep if someone is able to finish it and publish it and shit like that Here's a guy I did not expect to be on this list. Uh As I was looking at this list of 54 people, he was the most interesting one. (laughs) Because I I saw his name and I went, well, who the fuck is that? Okay. And I looked more into it and holy crap. This dude, he was a king. Uh. His name is Ghazi, and I'm going to murder this, Ghazi Ibn Faisal, I think. (laughs) He was the king of Iraq from 1933 to 1939, having briefly been crowned prince of Syria in 1920. He was rumored to harbor sympathies for Nazi Germany and also put forth the claim for Kuwait to be annexed to Iraq. For this purpose, he had his own radio station promote that claim and many other radical views. Wow. So this dude had a radio station Jesus. talking about the Nazis <laughs> and the combination to Kuwait and to Iraq. How about that shit? And it must have been popular enough. People were listening and shit. I mean, hell. I mean, I had to have. He was the king. The king. Yeah. <laughs> king Ghazi died in April of 1939 in an accident involving a sports car that he was driving. Another car accident. According to some scholars, a common view by many Iraqis at the time was that he was killed on orders because of his plans for the unification of Iraq with Kuwait. Huh. Conspiracy. Yeah. A lot of people believe that, I guess. Mm-hmm. I I just read that and I was like, this dude's a king? <laughs> Did you say king? In the 30s? Okay. Let's do that. Never heard of the guy, though. No, no, me either. Not much of a king. <laughs> this guy, you may have heard of some of his songs, but you probably don't know him by name. His name is Jesse Belvin. He was an American singer, pianist, and songwriter in the 1950s. Belvin co-wrote the 1954 Penguin's popular song, Earth Angel. Oh, and it sold more than 10 million copies. Uh-huh. You know that song. Yes, I do. Yep, so do I. Yeah, uh, the movie, Back to the Future. Yeah, yep. yeah, it was in that. Yep. I think that's where I first heard it. Probably, well, yeah, that's where it's probably more popular for... Oh, know, yeah, it had to have. Unfortunately, his success was cut short by his death in, yet again, a car crash. The accident, which also claimed the lives of his wife and their driver, oh, occurred shit. after a concert in Arkansas that had been disrupted at least twice by white supremacists. Mm-hmm. Mm. According to the state trooper at the scene of the accident, 
the tires of Belvin's 1959 Cadillac had, quote-unquote, obviously been tampered with. Uh. What did we say? Fucking white people. (laughs) Fucking white people. (laughs) Number 18, Mr. Leslie Harvey. Leslie Harvey. What the hell is that? No clue. But his uh, death was interesting. Leslie Harvey was born in Govan, Glasgow. Glasgow? Glasgow? I don't know. In the 1960s. Huh. He was asked to join The Animals by Alan Price, but chose to stay with his brother in the Alex Harvey Soul Band. So he could have been in The Animals. Son of a... Okay. Yeah. Uh, But he chose not to. He stayed with his brothers. Yep. Shit. Later on down the road... He joined another Scottish band called the Blues Council. They made one record, and in March of 1965, their tour van crashed, killing the vocalist and the bassist. After that, the rest of the band kind of, you know, dispersed. Dispersed, yep. Yep. Kind of broke up because of said situation. Yep, yep. Harvey then co-founded the Stone Crows in late 1969. While on stage in 1972... He was electrocuted when he touched a microphone that was not grounded while the fingers of his other hand were holding the strings of his guitar. Damn. He, like, he he made the circuit. circuit yep, he, he finished yeah. the circuit. for yeah. the. <laughs> it had been incorrectly stated that the incident happened on a rainy day with puddles on the stage. However, they were playing indoors, so go figure. What? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Some, some people just want to watch the world burn. They don't say the right things like they're supposed to. Talk about a way to die. No shit. A roadie, though, had attempted to unplug the guitar but was unsuccessful, and then Harvey later died of his injuries. That'd be one one way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would hurt so bad. What do you think it felt like? Shocking. Tingly. Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) No shit. No shit. (laughs) It was a shocking experience. (laughs) One of Tingly. (laughs) Could say it shocked the hell out of him. (laughs) He must have gotten some air. As soon as that he made the connection, he probably jumped. There's a good chance. It's a bum way to go, though. You may know this person. Probably not. It's associated with country music. The man's name is Chris Austin. So he was an American country singer who signed to Warner Bros. Records in 1988 and charted three singles on the Billboard Hot Country Songs chart. Austin also co-wrote with Ricky Skaggs in 1991 in his single Same Old Love. Hmm. Austin was most known for playing the guitar and fiddle for Ricky Skaggs and Reba McIntyre Road Bands. Uh Austin toured with Reba McIntyre, until an airplane crash carrying Austin and six other members of McIntyre's band and her road manager crash into a nearby mountain after taking off from an airport in yeah. San Diego, California, killing all on board. Where was Eva? <laughs> Probably taking a different, her private jet. Private jet. Probably. Damn. I'm, I'm taking the jet, everybody else. You get the right coach. That's bullshit. Into a, a mountain. I wonder if it was foggy. You know what else is foggy? <laughs> D.B. Cooper. <laughs> that was a coo- that was a foggy day too. How do you think you'd react if you're gonna know that you're gonna crash head on into a mountain? Try to jump the fuck out. How are you gonna how are you, how are you gonna open that or, door? Well, is there a way to fly, uh, alter the course of the plane, or are you kind of stuck where the way it is? No, I think they were stuck the way they were. Well, then, yeah, then if that plane crashed into a mountain, right? Understandable, but. Planes are big. So are mountains. So are mountains. <laughs> mountains are obviously bigger. The mountain one. <laughs> mountain one, plane zero. zero. I wonder how many mountains have claimed the lives of people in airplanes. Just in airplanes, nothing and, and else. Hell, even the ones that we can't even record. That we don't know about. Yeah. Right. I'm sure there's plenty of them. I'm sure there's Hundreds. a lot. I wouldn't even know where to start looking. I'm sure they're out there. Wouldn't you want to start at the foggy area? <laughs> I, the foggiest area possible. <laughs> Right now, that's the entire Midwest. <laughs> Thanks, Canada. We have come to the last one on our list. Oh, no. This man's name is Richie Edwards, or 
Richard James Edwards. You can call him Dick Ed for short. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Richard. <laughs> So he was also known as Richie James or Richie Maniac. And he was a Welsh musician who was the lyricist and rhythm guitarist of an alternate rock band called the Maniac Street Preachers. Hmm. No. Sounds some like some wild ass congregation, man. Could you imagine that priest? <laughs> <laughs> he'd just be he'd just be praising at the top of his lungs. <laughs> He was known for his dark, politicized, and intellectual songwriting, which combined with a mysterious and eloquent character. It has all but assured him cult status. Hmm. He has been cited as a leading lyricist of his generation. Still don't know anything about this dude. No. Nope. Not a clue. I mean... No, I do. Nope. The weird thing about this is that he disappeared February 1st, 1995. He's not dead? No, he just disappeared. They don't know if he's dead. Oh. On November 24th of 2008, he was declared presumed dead, quote-unquote, on or since February of 1995. Huh. That's why he made this list. So he disappeared in 1995. The ninth Maniac Street Preachers album, The Journey for Plague Lovers, released in May of 2009, is composed entirely of song lyrics left by Edwards. As of 2005, the remaining members of the Maniac Street Preachers were still paying 25% of royalties into his account under his name. Oh, holy shit. So I did some more research as to what happened, and it is real weird. Okay. I mean, shit does not make sense. Like, they found his car at one point, but they also got like sighting of him that he was getting on a plane at the same time his car wasn't supposed to be in the right place or some shit two different places yeah it was okay. it was weird maybe that was him faking his own death kind of thing or just you know dropping off the side of the earth maybe they found just some everyday items in his car nothing weird no like death note or anything he just right yeah like vanished yeah straight up just like you know if you that, that'd be one way to disappear is, you know, you do a normal thing or you go off one direction, then in, in reality, you know, you're in the other direction, the whole hand-eye trick. It's true. Yeah. Make you a distraction and out the back door, so to speak. You'd have to go to the very last place, like where the trail ends, you know. I'm sure they haven't found anything. I didn't find anything about it, like when I was looking it up. Right. They could still be looking for him. He's probably living on his life out in the Caribbean or some shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe he is dead. We don't know. Right. We just don't know. Just don't know. Out of all of these that we have went over. All 20. All 20 of them. Which one piqued your interest the most? Kurt Cobain. The Kurt Cobain one. Uh -huh. Classic. Yeah. Obviously, because uh, I, I think there's more to the story, to be honest with you, but that's just me. Yeah, there's probably something that someone's not telling people mm -hmm. that happened and and that one, you know, because not only the, his death, but I mean, just the, the artist alone, the music that he gave us, it was one off. You can't duplicate that shit. No, you can't. Very popular still today. A lot of fans still. That's a good thing. Hell yeah. Amen to that. Still a fan too. Yeah, I'm one of them also. I like The King. <laughs> the King was my favorite. I'm f well, because it's got like, maybe he was <laughs> offed by somebody and he was assassinated, you know? <laughs> they don't say for sure. It wasn't much of a king if we never heard about him. Well, why would we hear about him in America? We're taught American things, not world things. Still a king nonetheless, and he's history. I suppose, but at the time he wasn't doing anything with America, so why would he be in our history mm, books, you know? Yeah. Because we don't give a fuck about everybody <laughs> else. That... That's not just me saying... No, that is... You no, know, that's just like a... That's what it is, though. I mean, it, that's how America rolls. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks, Aaron, for substituting for Cody. Absolutely. We appreciate it. Maybe we'll have you on again sometime. Only all three of us. Hey, hey. hey. Yeah, hopefully he'll... He'll get oh, better. Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. hopefully. He's got to get over this. 
you know, mm-hmm. tragedy. It's just, it's so, it's rough to really watch what he's going through at this moment in time. I'm worried for him, and I want him to be okay in the long run. I just appreciate all of you coming along with us on this journey, listening to us. Thanks for coming again, Aaron. Not a problem. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. And as always, this is the Edible Attitude Podcast. <laughs>